talk about the, the history and philosophy of astrobiology and what, what that could mean and what, what kind of questions are we working with. And, and so uh, I, I will start with a, a, a shocking announcement. Uh, if you didn't know, uh, a alien exist. They really exist. I, I believe that. In our heads. In our heads, you could find aliens. We, we have talked about aliens and extraterrestrial life as far back as to the antiquity. So the idea of thinking about life out there, out, outside Earth, is uh, a long, there's a long history b behind it. And that's what, what history and philosophy of astrobiology is about. The human conceptions of, of life and extraterrestrial life. Because even though there are no life out there in outer space, uh, we still think about these ideas. So that's what, what, what the history of astrobiology is about. Our conceptions and our ideas about life. So th that's what I'm going to talk about today. How, how it's possible to, to think about extraterrestrial life. How, how did the science of astrobiology emerged? How did it, what, what kind of factors is involved in, in the emerge, in the uh, evolution or, or the development of astrobiology? And what, what requisites are needed in order to think? Uh, they come. Yeah, they, they are coming now. This alarm. Should I wait? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Good. So, so, what requisites are needed in order to think about habitable planets beyond Earth? What, what kind of requisites? Uh, what, what kind of? Uh, ideas or uh, functions or uh, uh, methods or, or uh, ingredients s sort of you need in order to, to develop uh, astrobiology? What, what kind of factors uh, is involved in the uh, emergement of, of, of uh, astrobiology? And it, it's of course uh, a question of science, but it's not only about typical questions about the theories and, and uh, methods I within science. So the history of astrobiology uh, studies the emerge, uh, emergence of scientific, uh, uh, a scientific discipline, how and why. So it could be the, the history of planetary astronomy, the history of paleontology, the history of the concept of evolution, the history of biology, the history of origin of life. So it's many different kinds of scientific questions that form what, what is uh, history of astrobiology today. Uh, it's, a, it's about exploration, the history of exploration. Uh, about new methods, uh, new instruments, new technology. And I will g give some examples of that during this lec uh, lecture, how technology uh, changed our way of understanding uh, nature. That, that technology are, as you know, instruments that you, we use for understanding nature. And, the development of technology is very important uh, I I in the history of, of, of astrobiology. We, we usually think that we have first science and then comes uh, from science we, we could develop new technology and from new technology we could have uh, economical growth and uh, economical improvement. That's the linear idea we have about technology. But you could say the other way around, that we start with technology that gives you science, new ways of doing science, and not the other way around. That, that's just popular, that, that, it's very popular among our politicians to think that 
science leads to technology. And it's a good argument for us to use when we want the, the politicians to, to spend more money on science. But you, you could say it's the other way around uh, many times. Uh, and of course, it's about theories, uh, theories of, of, uh, of uh, different theories, uh, explanations and models. Uh, it's also involved in the history of, of astrobiology. Uh, and it's also about organization, and that I think is a quite important point that the history of astrobiology is, as I earlier said, it's not about only scientific uh, questions or methods or exploration or um, finding new uh, knowledge. It's also a question of organization, how we organize science in uh, institutions, uh, in uh, laboratories, uh, journals, space programs, international collaborations. If we take, for example, the astrobiology community, you could see that, that uh, uh, it's an emerging field, it's an emerging scientific discipline because of that we have much more scientific uh, conferences in astrobiology nowadays. We have even uh, a number of journals uh, devoted to, to, to uh, astrobiology. So that's our, our science of, of an emerging field, uh, is science. <coughs> when, when we find these organization around it, uh, like journals, institutions, and uh, organizations, and, and uh, and journals and so on. And uh, especially astrobiology has a story behind it as a, a very, uh, ha have a lot of public uh, communication. Uh, and it's about politics and economy. Uh, we, we uh, w when we are doing science, we, we need arguments why we are doing it for the politicians and they, they think uh, or, or they want to see economical growth and uh, that new jobs are created by, this, by, our, uh, by, by the universities and our, uh, our innovations. So there are also connections between economics, pol politics uh, and science. And especially in the scientific disciplines, the science disciplines, it's very costly. It costs enormous amount of money, like CERN, for example, or all these observatories are very costly. Uh, and that needs good arguments, good connections with politicians. And that needs also um, international collaboration. You, you can't, uh, nowadays you, you can't really, uh, one, one small country uh, like my own, Sweden for example, can't build this enormous uh, expensive uh, laboratories. We, we need collaborations, international collaborations in order to, 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 to be able to pay for this uh, these instruments and laboratories. And fin finally, it's also about the imagination. And that I think uh, it's, it's very typical for the astrobiology community that m most people around us in the general public have ideas about extraterrestrial life. They have seen it on, on movies and they have read science, science fiction novels and they have conceptions of what it could be uh, and and this also uh, th that is also forming th this community astrobiology community and also uh, the, the uh, one of the intriguing questions is how do we think about that we don't know because we don't have any clue how, how the, or very little 
knowledge or, or, or ideas of how they really looked like, the, the, these, uh, these extraterrestrials, if they exist. But we still have uh, imagined it and we still, still have um, ideas about it. For example, in, in those pictures, uh, if we want to depict an, uh, a dangerous and evil uh, evil alien, you, you, you show it like a lizard or like a crocodile or, or with sharp teeth. And so, so you use your, your knowledge from your ordinary life that you transfer to this unknown. And in the, sa the same time uh, from the other movie that you have probably seen, uh, the, the uh, friendly Friendly ones are, are have blue skin. Uh, they are, but they are quite similar to human beings. They have even bigger eyes. That is a sign of, of friendliness. Uh, so, so we we are sort of trapped in our brains, actually, in, trapped in our history, trapped in our society. It's very difficult for for human beings to go outside our own uh, own. Uh, pre-knowledge or, or preconceptions of, of the unknown. But uh, as I uh, started my lecture, the, this story about the uh, history of astrobiology goes very long back in time, uh, back to the Greek, Greek uh, philosophers in the antiquity, they, they had an uh, uh, they, they had actually ideas of extraterrestrial life, uh, and and there are a couple of ideas that is connected to this. That the cosmos, so is an order, uh, uh, is the order of thing. There is a, an order out there in space. That's one of the most important starting. Um, axioms or, or starting presumptions in science that there is actually an order out there in outside in nature. It's just for us human beings to find this order, and that, that's the one of the starting presumptions in, in the science. The other is uh, there is a causality that there are regularities in nature. There are no, nature is not uh, entirely chaotic. It could seem like it is very chaotic, <laughs> but there is regularities. There is uh, a cause and effect. There is uh, some structure, some, some order of, of the things. So that's what, what the Greek uh, natural philosopher started with, the, these, these presumptions that we could actually find uh, the, the causality of things. <coughs> And very early on, uh, the, the uh, antique philosophers thought that it could be, be, be life out there. Anaximander, already in the 6th century BC, said that it could be infinity of worlds. Uh, worlds that appear and disappear in, in a succession. That it could be uh, uh, an infinity infinite amount of, of worlds coming and become destroys and uh, are reborn all the time. And the, the atomist uh, pluralism was also a, a way of understanding uh, why life could be, uh, it could exist out there in space. Uh, Levkippus and Democritus and the Epicurus in the third to fifth century BC said that uh, that everything around us is built up by atoms and th this th these kinds of atoms could be uh, uh, they, they are the same in the entire universe so th these stars or these uh, uh, planets around us are made of the same stuff and because they are made of the same stuff why couldn't also they have life and 
have the same, uh, we could see the same phenomena out there uh, on other planets or other stars. Uh, Metrodorus of Chios, he had a, a, a quite interesting uh, um, comment on, on, on this question of the plurality of worlds. And he, he said that it would be strange if a single ear of corn grew in a large plain, or there were only one world in the infinite. As the same, it would be very strange if we go to a cornfield and there is a only one uh, uh, growing corn and in that field. Everything else is dead. In the, in the same, the same is with all the stars out there in space. It would be very uh, strange if this would be the only place in the, in the entire universe where there are life. So that, that's, a, that, that's a common idea in astrobiology, that it couldn't be, it would be more uh, impossible or, or more uh, um, less likely that, that, that everything is dead out there. Than it could, than that there is life on somewhere else. So w when we think today and look up to the stars and see that it are billions of, of stars, own, uh, not just only in our own uh, own um, galaxy, but also in all the other galaxies that are billions of galaxies out there in space. So that that that's a common argument. Uh, that is scientifically not valid, actually, but it's still something that we think it's, it, it must, be, must be like that. So this, this argument you see through the entire history of astrobiology. But it, um, even though there were people thinking that there could be life out there in space, the, the most dominant way of understanding physics and uh, astronomy was the uh, Aristotelian philosophy uh, that goes back to Aristotle in the who lived between 300, 384 to 322 BC. And his natural philosophy became very influent uh, and became the dominant, uh, dominant way of understanding physics and nature up until the, to the Renaissance. And he said that there, there is actually a, a, a sublunar world, the world uh, below the moon uh, th that is completely different from the world above the moon. So the sublunar uh, sub sub world where we live, all the um, objects are, f are, are, are falling up or down. But uh, in the supralunar world above the moon, everything is moves in perfect circles. So there's two, in his uh, understanding, there's two kinds of physics. <laughs> One physics that is valid here on the Earth and another physics out there in space. Uh, and so that makes it uh, difficult to, to believe in extraterrestrial life in that kind of philosophy because uh, the, the supralunar world is something very different from ours. So why, so why c should it be life there? It should only be life here on Earth, where, where we have this earthly kind of physics. <coughs> so, and he's also famous for, for his idea about the four elements. And he also talked about an, an eternal, unchanging and closed universe. So it was a closed, unchanging universe. But uh, you could also find it in the literature, in the Roman literature, um, uh, Greek and Roman literature, also uh, imaginary stories about uh, people traveling to foreign worlds. The, the first uh, science fiction novel uh, ever written about uh, 
uh, uh, travel in the universe was written by Lucian of S Samosata in the second century AD, the true history. Uh, and he, he, uh, he is, he uh, admits that he is lying, but he, and he says, my lie is more honest, since even though I do not tell the truth, I am still honest when I say that I am lying. So it's about, uh, he, he tells a, a story about what, when he traveled with boat to Gibraltar, and then he, he came into a, a storm and the, the ship are thrown up into the space and, and, and suddenly he, he came uh, after a, a couple of days to the moon where he meets the, the king of the moon and he starts uh, become a servant of the, of the king of the moon and, uh, and help the king in the moon in his fights against the king of the sun. Uh, so uh, he, he, he uh, tells about the absurd life on, of the moon inhabitants. The children are born from the legs of men, and uh, uh, so so it's a, a way of uh, an ab absurd uh, story. And other examples is, is Kikero, uh, who wrote the book uh, Somnium Scipionis. Scipio's dream. It's also about a, 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 a man, Scipio, who dreams that he, he travels into space. And in that story, he, he described the Aristotelian or, or Ptolemaic uh, worldview. So, so for me, I think what is interesting in the history of astrobiology is questions of what is true actually, how could we be sure that something is true and how, how could we search for true, uh, true understanding of things and, and how could we know, uh, what, what could we know? We, we could know um, that, that life exists here on earth but could we know that life exists elsewhere? And could we ever know uh, that life will, will not exist anywhere else? We, we can't go everywhere in the universe and, and look under every stone and search for life. We, we will never know that life doesn't exist. We can only know that life exists somewhere else. That, that's, we need only one example of life outside Earth, and then we know that life could exist out elsewhere. But we could never know that life will not exist. And where is the limits of our imaginations? Uh, as I said, we are sort of trapped in our brains, and how could we go beyond uh, our ordinary uh, understanding of the world? And that's, I think, is, is one of the uh, most intriguing things with science, that science could go beyond our ordinary beliefs of how things is working. Think about Einstein's theory of relativity. It's, it much, it's something very different from our ordinary experience of space and time. So science is a way of going beyond the limits of, of our ordinary thinking. So in, in, the, uh, in the antiquity in the, and in the Middle Ages, uh, people uh, had a Eucentric worldview. It's based on Aristotle's philosophy and uh, and also Ptolemy Ptolemyos. Um, the astronomer who wrote the very influential book uh, Almagest in the second century AD, wh where he explains the, the mathematics and physics behind, behind the Eurocentric worldview, where Earth is in the center of the Uran in the universe and in rest, and the sun, moon, and the planets uh, are circling around it. And so 
in the, in that worldview, the uh, Eurocentric worldview, Earth has a very unique position, and life could only exist on Earth, because Earth is something, uh, the or the planets that circling around Earth are something completely different, uh, ma made of another stuff, uh, ether, and it's not made of, of the same stuff <coughs> that we we find here on Earth, uh, like. Like like uh, uh, earth, uh, air, and and fire and water, according to the four elements of Aristotle. So, so that's uh, that's uh, the worldview that that dominated uh, human thinking in in the Western world at least until the Renaissance. In the Middle Ages. Uh, Humans are in the center of creation. The, the entire universe is, is uh, uh, created by God for the purpo his purposes uh, for the humans. So humans are in the center of creation. And around Earth, there are these uh, spheres uh, of the planets. Uh, and it ends with this a fixed hemisphere the, where the, the starry sky or you find the starry scar, uh, sky. So it's a very closed uh, universe, a small, closed and uh, finite universe. And uh, so th there were also arguments against the idea of, of of the, um, the, the, the against the, I, the ideas of, of there could be life out there, and the uh, ideas that uh, in in the Bible that um, that prove th that the theologian said proved uh, the the uh, geocentric world, and uh, one of famous passage in the Bible uh, by Joshua. Uh, Tenth uh, uh, chapter says that sun uh, stands still over Gibeon and you moon over the valley of Ajalon. Uh, so the sun st stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. Uh, that's an example. Uh, they, they said that because God co could. Uh, um, say that the, the the sun should stop uh, and and the moon sh could should stop. That was uh, an argument s saying that it, it couldn't be uh, that that Earth is circling around the sun. It must be the sun that is moving and circling around uh, uh, around Earth. Alberto Magnus, he, he uh, uh, a medieval scholar in the 13th century, he, he said that since one of the most von wondrous and noble questions is whether there is one world or many, it seems desirable for us to inquire about it. So the, the question if there are a plurality of worlds was, was still a question. Uh, and uh, because there were one uh, one argument, uh, religious argument, wh why it could be more than one world. Because God is almighty and ha he has all the power and he's good, uh, so he he should have filled the entire universe with life. Why should he have uh, created uh, thousands or millions of stars? That are, are are just the dead um, uh, celestial bodies. So why uh, why did he do that? Instead, if he was good, he, he would spread life because life is something good. So there were arguments uh, against and also um, uh, for the existence of other worlds. Uh, Thomas uh, of uh, Aquino, uh, who is one of the perhaps the most famous uh, medieval scholar who 
who merged uh, the Aristotelian philosophy with the Catholic uh, Christian philosophy. So they became uh, integrated uh, and a coherent system of philosophy. He, he said that God chose to create only one world. He, he made that decision. Um, and uh, Nicholas of Cusa in, the, in 1440, he said that rather than think that so many stars and parts of the heavens are uninhabited, we will suppose that in every region there are inhabitants, deferring in nature by rank, all owing their origin to God. So, in, in 1277, the idea that the first cause, the first cause that is God, namely God, has created more than one world, this idea was placed on the list of heretical ideas. So it was difficult to, to defend the, the idea of the plurality of worlds and the existence of extraterrestrial life. But something changed during the 16th, 16th century and 17th century uh, that, that, that changed the, the, the possibility to think about extraterrestrial life. And I, I would say that in the 16th century, man, uh, the human kind, had their first more solid scientific arguments for the existence <coughs> of uh, extraterrestrial life and uh, the existence of other worlds. It, the, the 16th century and 17th century is usually called the scientific revolution, where we find uh, an, an increasing amount of scientific works that change the, the human perceptions of, of the world. The most, one of the most uh, famous uh, examples are Copernicus, uh, and also we have Kepler and Newton, we have um, Descartes, and we have um, also uh, Vesalius and uh, Harvey in medicine. So that were uh, new ways of understanding the, the, the world. And one of the, the, the methods or tools the scientists uh, began utilize was mathematics. That mathematics was a way of understanding the world. It, mathematics was a tool to describe the world. It, it, you could find an order in, in how things behave and express this knowledge in the mathematics. And with this mathematical uh, um, uh, and natural laws, you could also uh, transmit or, or transfer these ideas to other minds. So, uh, in, the, in the 16th century, it started, one, uh, people also started to think that, that what the people in the antiquity said about nature is not nothing that is the, 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 it's not the last, uh, uh, the, the last uh, uh, thing that, that, that is said about the, the nature. You could actually find new knowledge. Uh, it's, uh, you could say that in the 16th century, people uh, discovered the, their ignorance that there, is, there, there are actually things that we don't know. Uh, every answer to our questions are not within the Bible or not in the philosophy of Aristotle or in the, the scholars from the antiquity. There are things that we don't know and there, there are methods to find new knowledge through mathematics but also uh, through experiments, through experience and experiments through e experiments were, were a kind of a questioning nature that you could could find a, 
um, s structure, structured way of uh, <coughs> gaining knowledge through a, a, a very um, concrete and closed way of, of, of seeing how, how nature behaves in, in, in particular circumstances. So, so the typical idea during this 16th and 17th, especially in the 17th and 18th century, was the me mechanical worldview that everything in nature is a, 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 like a, a machine. There is no difference actually between the machines that we humans build and the, the world machine that God, uh, God have created. They are following the same mechanical laws. So observations and experiments became very important in the, in the 17th century and also new technology and uh, I will give you two examples uh, soon uh, where new technology changed the, the view of the world and the possibility to understand the world. Uh, but you could also add other, uh, other um, factors behi behind the, the change in the, during the scientific revolution. Uh, humans, uh, uh, the, the trade uh, with other parts of the world increased. Uh, we discovered, or the Western Europeans uh, discovered new new continents, new, new countries uh, outside Europe. And this, this, uh, this idea that there are life outside Europe uh, with another culture uh, also was an intriguing, uh, mind-boggling idea that I, I think lies behind also those uh, imaginary voyages in, in the 17th century. So there are economical, political factors also involved in, in the, the scientific revolution. So uh, the, then in, in 1543, uh, Nicolaus Copernicus, uh, a Polish uh, astronomer, uh, wrote his book on the revolutions of the celestial spheres, where he, he actually say that sun is in the center of the planetary system in rest, and Earth is a planet among other planets. So he, he, he placed Earth in the in a orbit around the Sun. Uh, and the, the, the reason why he did that w was not actually for, for he was a, a true believer in, in Christ, Christian religion, so it was not because of, of a, an attack towards the scholastic uh, and Christian philosophy. It was a, a way of d describing the, the universe in a, in a better way. He, he wanted a, a, a mathematical way of des describing how the planets behave because it was important for um, uh, making calendars for, for for timekeeping, if we could know when Mars is, uh, w when it comes back, uh, back every year, and how the Moon is uh, changing, uh, so the need for better calendars uh, uh, led Copernicus into th this idea that that maybe we could could think that. Uh, um, Sun is in, in the center of, of, of the planetary system, and actually, he, he didn't gain so much in in, in the mathematical uh, explanation with <coughs> this new system. The Ptolemaic, the Eurocentric worldview, uh, could be used for for uh, for, for uh, anticipate the the movements of the planets, but, but it was still a little bit. Uh, easier way of, of, of uh, seeing our planetary system. 
So when making Earth a planet, the earthly and heavenly were confused. So th that's uh, made him unpopular among, among ma many people in the, in the Christian world because he and those who had a scholastic Aristotelian philosophy because he, he mixed these two worlds together. If, if uh, he mixed the supralunar world with this sublunar world, so, uh, so the entire f natural philosophy of Aristotle didn't work anymore. So that, that was a very absurd thing for, for many people. But when he did that, he, he also opened up uh, the idea that that our Earth uh, is a planet like the other planets. That our Earth is not something, uh, something unique. It's uh, rather a typical. That's the uh, the Copernican uh, principle that is sometimes used in astrobiology. That Earth is is a, a typical uh, planet. There are, are, are it could be many other uh, Earths out there in space, and and the planets in our without, within our solar system uh, are not so much different from Earth actually, according to a Copernican uh, worldview, and that's uh, started uh, new imaginations in the 17th century. What one famous defenders are of the Copernican worldview, Giordano Bruno, who, who was uh, burnt uh, to death on Campo di Fiore in, in Rome in 1600 because of his beliefs in, 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 uh, in the plurality of worlds. That was not probably the, the main cause for, for his death, but uh, he also disbelieved some very basic uh, Christian ideas li li like the the the, uh, the, the uh, Trinity and and uh, and other uh, important uh, basic <coughs> Christian ideas. And he said that everything moves. There is no fixed point in the absolute in absolute rest. And the stars are sons of their own planetary system. So the stars are not just shining spots of ether. They are also suns that could have their own solar system, their own planetary system. So in the 16th century, in the 17th century, the universe expanded. It was no anymore this closed uh, closed Aristotelian medieval world w that is closed uh, within this hemisphere or, or this, this sphere, uh, the starry sky, or the starry sky. Instead, uh, universe sort of expanded and the distances in the universe are, are became bigger and there were also the possibility of other worlds. Blaise Pascal, he said that the eternal silence of those infinite spaces frightens me uh, when he, he felt this expanding universe. Uh, important in, in this story uh, towards uh, a mo modern worldview is uh, Tycho Brahe, a Danish astronomer who, who uh, had his observatory on the island of Wien uh, near Copenhagen in Denmark. You, to, <coughs> to the left you can see his observatory uh, that he had on the island and one of his instruments. And he, he made a... Uh, he was very keen observer uh, and he, he uh, studied the and, uh, and looked for the positions of the stars. And he did it with his naked eye. It was only with his eye in this quite a 
quite uh, simple instruments uh, uh, like sextant and, and other uh, instruments that he, he could see the, uh, the exact positions of the stars. But his lists of po the positions of stars were important for his followers, especially uh, Kepler. But he did also some uh, uh, observations. In, this, in 1572, he uh, observed a new star, uh, Nova, in the constellation of Cassiopeia. So he suddenly, in 1572, he found a, a new star that shouldn't be there on the sky. Uh, and that was a, an argument for that the universe is actually changing. It's not something fixed that had been created once in, in the time I, I, during the uh, creation of the world according to, uh, to, to the Bible. Instead, the universe is changing. And that's also uh, something that changed the mind of humans, that the universe could change. And what, w what will that mean for us? Uh, Kepler, who, who was a, a student of, of Tycho Brahe, he, he, he uh, uh, got hold of, of uh, Tycho Brahe's um, lists of star, star positions, and he could use these exact positions uh, in order to find a, a more mathematical way of, 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 of describing the, the motions of, of the planets. And it, it goes back to th this idea that, that a actually the whole nature, the whole universe is mathematics. Uh, Kepler wrote a book called Mysterium Cosmographicum in 1596 where he say, <coughs> when God created the universe, he used the bodies of geometry. So actually, w when God wrote uh, or created the world, he used mathematics and geometry. That was his instrument. And f the, the, uh, the, the, the task for uh, an astronomer is to find this mathematics behind universe. Uh, it was also, this idea was also called the book of nature. Uh, for example, Galileo, he, he had this idea that God wrote two books. He wrote the Bible that, that tells about <coughs> moral things and the history of humankind. But he wrote also another book uh, the book of nature that is written in mathematics. It's not written in Hebrew or in Latin or Greek. It's written in mathematics, in, in, in uh, numbers, in geometrical figures. So that's uh, a, a typical idea in the scient uh, scientific revolution. Uh, Copernicus, he, he also uh, wrote uh, a science fiction story uh, called Somnium or a Dream uh, in 1634. And it's about a, 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 a man called Duracotus who, who traveled to, 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 uh, to, to Tycho Brahe in Denmark and then um, uh, went on on the, on the travel uh, to to uh, out in the space to the moon, uh, where he also find that moon was inhabited, and there were a lot of uh, um, uh, strange, uh, huge <laughs> animals on on uh, on the on uh, on the moon. Uh, but but there was also it was actually sent. Scientific, science fiction story that were based on scientific beliefs. It was not just a, an imaginary story uh, because there are also uh, 
ideas about there could, that there sh could be atmosphere on on the moon, and there were uh, uh, mountains and valleys on the moons. So we're uh, actually based on on scientific beliefs. Uh, and of course, uh, Kepler has been most renowned because of his his explanations of, of the elliptical orbits in our solar system. And th these ideas he, he came to through, uh, through the, um, uh, Tycho Brahe's lists of uh, st star positions. But uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that new technology have, ha have changed uh, the, the story of the history of astrobiology. And, and uh, in 1608, uh, the invention of telescope was announced in Holland. And uh, Galileo, uh, the Italian uh, mathematician, he, he, uh, he, he heard about it, read about it. And he understood that this instrument that were meant to, to be used for, for military purposes could be used for other things, you could turn it up to the stars and and see what, what's up there in the stars. So he built his his own instrument in 1609 and published his uh, uh, discoveries in 1610 in in a book called Siderius Nuncius, Siderial Messenger. Uh, Messenger. So when he, he turned the telescope to the moon, he, he found something uh, that struck him. He, he, he uh, described uh, the surface of the moon that consisted of mountains and valleys. And the moon was, according to Galilei, full of inequalities, uneven, full of hollows and protuberances, just like the surface of the Earth. So that, that was an e experimental uh, um, <coughs> proof that that uh, moon was something quite similar to Earth. So the planetary, the planets and and the moon were s not something completely different from Earth. It seems to have the same topography. So that that started. Uh, um, uh, a trend the, in the in the seventeenth century, uh, uh, w where people began thinking about life on on the moon. If if moon is similar to 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 Earth, why why couldn't it be life on moon as well? So this is a, this is a very typical way of uh, arguing argue, arguing in astrobiology with with. Uh, with a kind of analogy arguments, a grand analogy, that y you know something about Earth, and if we could find similar uh, uh, environments out there, we could conclude that they have life also. Um, logically speaking, uh, analogical arguments are not valid. It could be a good way of, of of doing research or doing looking for something, it could be a good way of starting looking for for finding life, but it couldn't prove anything. Even though, as many people said in the 17th century, that that the moon was nearly exactly has have have the ex exactly the same kind of nature, it still has no life. So, but, but that's, uh, that, that was an intriguing ide idea for, for many. So uh, in the 17th century, we see a number of, of imaginary voyages to, to the moon, where, where they are talking about uh, how, how, how the traveler meets uh, lunarians uh, who live there on, on, the, on the planet or in, on the moon. 
John Wilkins, he, he wrote one of, of, of the most famous uh, moon travel stories in the 17th century. He, he, he said that it is possible that our posterity will invent a way to travel to this, this other world. And if there are inhabitants there, we will have commerce with them. So if, if we find uh, people uh, on other planets, we will start having commerce. But uh, Alexander Ross, uh, he, he uh, defended uh, the, uh, the, the Aristotelian way of uh, the uh, Aristotelian worldview, and he, he wrote another book as a defense of the traditional idea called the new planet, no planet, or the earth, no wandering star except in the wandering heads of the Galileans. Uh, so he said that this was just imagined, uh, imaginary uh, thing, imaginary ideas of fools. Uh, other moon travels uh, uh, were, were written by Francis Godwin, uh, John Wilkins, as I mentioned, and Athanasius Kircher. Um, and it's a utopian genre inspired by, as I said, the topography of the moon, but also probably the geographical discoveries of the Earth. And these travels are not so much science, of course. Uh, it's more, in the say, they say very little about the universe, but they say something about human imagines, our ideas and how we think about extraterrestrial life. And also, they were used as a way of uh, put forward a critique toward the, the terrestrial life. Uh, it could be a way of discussing politics uh, or morality uh, or other stuff that could be difficult to, to, to write in an ordinary, ordinary story. Instead, you could uh, talk about this in an imaginary story. Uh, for example, Cyrano de Bergerac uh, wrote another uh, famous story, Histoire Comique. Uh, and uh, it's about uh, how he traveled up to the moon, or he tries to travel to the moon uh, by using w water bubbles or, or air bubbles uh, w w when in the morning, um, w w when uh, uh, the, the, the water is warming up, he could uh, attach himself to these water bubbles and travel up, up, up to the sky. And he, he also uh, write, uh, say that he, he has discovered a, a rocket and tries <coughs> to go to, to, to the moon. Uh, another important book, uh, uh, written in 1686 by uh, Fontenelle, uh, who was a secretary in the French uh, Science of uh, Academy of Sciences. He, he, he wrote a story. Uh, um, it's a dialogue between a, 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 a lady and a philosopher who walks in a park near a, a chateau somewhere in France. And they were discussing the plurality of worlds. So this was a way of, of uh, discussing the existence of plurality of worlds from a scientific view for a, a broader audience. Um, and the philosopher says that perhaps there are astronomers on Jupiter, and perhaps we cause them to engage in scientific quarrels so that some philosophers of Jupiter must defend themselves when they put forward the ludicrous opinion that we exist. So maybe there are philosophers out there in space that discuss if we are, are uh, existing. And that might be the same for us. It might be 
lecture halls out there in outer space on other solar systems that discussing if we are existing. And that's quite mind-boggling, I think. If, if there are, are other people out there in <coughs> space that think about the same things that we do. So, um, so, so their telescopes are directed towards ours, as ours are towards them. And that mutual curiosity with which the inhabitants of these planets consider each other and demand the one of the other, what world is that? What people inhabit it? So they, there are maybe people out there in space who, who put forward the same questions as we do. Uh, Fontanelli he also said that it could be uh, uh, the art of flying is hardly jet born. It will be perfected and someday people will fly up to the moon. Do we pretend to have discovered everything or do have br to have broke our knowledge to a point where nothing can be added to it? Oh, for mercy's sake, let us agree that there is still something left for the ages to come. And that's also a, a typical a, 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 um, change in the mind of, of humans in, in the end of the 17th century and in, in, during the 18th century. That is uh, the, the, um, the, the enlightenment thinking that there is a progress of, uh, there is a uh, progress in thought. There is, uh, uh, there is, um, there, there is uh, a progress w that there are, we could gain more knowledge. It's, we don't live in a, the golden age is not uh, uh, behind us. The golden age is before us and we could increase our knowledge and we could improve. And that, that's uh, something typical of the 18th century enlightenment thought, uh, I would say. Uh, Christian Huygens, uh, a, a Dutch uh, physician, he, uh, astronomer, he, he also wrote a book uh, called Cosmo Theoros, and he, he uh, really believed also that that could be life out there uh, in space. And one of his uh, interesting ideas in that book is that liquid water is necessary for life. So. We, we should look for water, according to uh, Huygens. And he, he, saw, he said that he saw darker and lighter spots on the surface of Mars and Jupiter that he, he uh, interpreted as, as water and ice. So uh, he, he, he said that there are water out there on the other planets, and that uh, um, could indicate that life could be, could exist on other planets. And he even s say that extraterrestrials are probably similar to earthlings. They would have mathematics, astronomy and music and have the similar mental capacities uh, and moral beliefs. Of course, the theory of gravity that Newton described in, in his Princip in Principia in 1687, uh, that was the final, uh, uh, final argument against uh, an Aristotelian worldview or, or, or uh, Aristotelian physics, where he actually could eliminate the difference between the terrestrial and the celestial physics. Everything could be explained by universal internal laws of nature. So the theory of gravity could explain why uh, objects are falling on Earth, but also why uh, the planets are orbiting uh, around the Sun. In the second edition of Principia in 1713, he even say that the house of God has many rooms. Why could not the immense space have inhabitants? So he has also the, this idea that, that it is, could be possible with life out there in, 
in outer space. But I would say that during the 18th century, this idea of that life could exist goes from a possibility towards a probability. It, it became pr more probable that, that life is out there. The French uh, Enlightenment philosophers like Diderot, D'Alembert, Dolbach, uh, they, they had idea of, of a plurality of worlds. Uh, uh, Dolbach, he, he questioned the anthropocentric conceptions of, of, of the idea. Um, Buffon, he, he said that the similar con physical conditions will, will give the same similar life forms. So if we find similar uh, environments, they will have similar life forms. Uh, uh, yeah, in Condillac, uh, I question this uh, analogy argument that I uh, mentioned. And another is uh, Kant, Immanuel Kant, the, the German philosopher. He's, he also wrote a, an entire book about astronomy in 1755. And he also believed in the existence of the plurality of worlds, where the, the, uh, the, the, all the planets in our solar system were, were inhabited, according to uh, Kant. And he also had this idea of the nebular hypothesis. Uh, in, the, in the end of 18th century, William Herschel uh, also uh, uh, were convinced that the, that um, the moon, even Venus, w was inhabited by planets, we, we, we inhabited with uh, uh, living creatures. Uh, he said that I'm convinced that these numberless small circles we see on the surface of the moon are creations of the lunar inhabitants and could be called their cities. Uh, the French, uh, the, the French, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the the um, the Swedish, uh, the Swedish spiritual seer Emanuel Swedenborg. He he wrote a book about his travels into space, in into the spiritual world of 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 uh, the extraterrestrial worlds. Uh, and he say, I, I, we don't perhaps need to, to read all this passage, but he, he says that there is something typical with, with our Earth, that we have physics and astronomy and, and chemistry and so on that is not known uh, elsewhere in the universe. And we have also the printing press, and that's why God came to our Earth, because we have the printing press, according to Swedenborg. Because with the printing press, <laughs> God could uh, diffuse or uh, transfer, uh, could spread his uh, uh, the knowledge of, of the Bible. Um, so th that's a, uh, also a question during the 18th century: the uh, connection or the the um, uh, b b between religion and astrobiology. Uh, as I said, there were arguments that uh, there could be life out there in space because God is uh, almighty and he, he would like to fill the entire universe with life. But there were also arguments uh, that ma made it complicated to, to think about worlds on, or, on, or people on other worlds. What happens with, with uh, Jesus? Uh, did he die here on Earth? Uh, just for us terrestrial beings, or did he die for everyone in the universe? Or are there millions of uh, Jesuses uh, out there in space? Or, or how, how could we explain this? So it became also a, a question of a, a re religious uh, problem. And a cultural uh, problem also, uh, or a cultural phenomena. Here is a, a quite a funny opera by, by Joseph Haydn, Il Mondo della Luna, from, from 1777, where an old man, Buonafredo, 
was, was tricked uh, or, or cheated by his, uh, uh, his future sons-in-law who, who, who said that he could go fly to the moon and meet the king on the moon. And the, so they are flying to the moon uh, and the king on, on, of the moon, he said uh, to Bonafedo that he should uh, let, let his daughters to marry the, their, their boyfriends. Maybe I, I could uh, I, I could end with with, with playing <coughs> this uh, this uh, no you can't hear no you don't hear no but it's a uh, uh, Yeah. Yeah. So you can l listen to that uh, uh, um, w w when you come back. This a, it's a quite a, a nice, nice opera. Uh, uh, do I still have some time, or or should we leave, leave, uh, f have a uh, discussion or, or questions or, or what do you think Arve or Muriel I have more to tell if you it's up to you we have some 12 minutes left okay o or and we start with 10 minutes left too. okay so. So, so if I continue 10 minutes more yeah. and then we have maybe 10 minutes for questions yeah. okay great uh, because uh, of course the history of actual biology doesn't end with uh, Joseph Haydn's opera. Uh, uh, something happened after that. Uh, uh, the, uh, so so in, in the uh, end of 18th century and the beginning of, of 19th century, uh, <coughs> astronomers discovered also new celestial bodies in our solar system. In 1781, William Herschel discovered the first planet since the antiquity, Uranus. Uh, and what he used was the telescope. And he could re really actually see, uh, discover a new planet with this new instrument. Uh, and the, it was followed by the asteroids uh, that was discovered. And sometimes they were, uh, um, were, were um, called uh, planets like Ceres, uh, Pallas, and Juno, and Vesta. Uh, and in the eight, yes, yeah, sir? You, you can see your flight. Oh, oh so, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Here. Here you see. Uh, in 1846, uh, a new a uh, planet was discovered uh, by Johann Gottfried Galle. Uh, and that was interesting in the history of planetary astronomy because he didn't discover it by, by the telescope, by seeing it. Instead, he discovered it because he, he found that, that the, the, the orbit of Saturn uh, and, and um, Uranus uh, was a little bit uh, disturbed of something else that must lie behind it. So he actually used the gravitational theory of, of uh, Newton in order to, to find out where this planet must be placed in our solar system. So, and then he, he, he counted, uh, uh, calculated where it could be found and turned his telescope towards this, this spot and found it. And th this way is actually something similar to what is going on today with uh, extrasolar planets, th that, that we could discover them uh, with help of, of uh, the gravitation and the, 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 the disturbance of the 
the planetary or, or of the orbits or, or the uh, in, our, in our modern case with, with uh, the, uh, the, the the stars in 1930 uh, pl uh, the final uh, uh, planet was discovered uh, Pluto that is no more a planet <coughs> as you might know uh, or dwarf planet. Uh, uh, another important step towards uh, mo modern astronomy is in 1761, 1769, when uh, during the Venus uh, transit, wh when the Venus was uh, uh, passing between Earth uh, and went uh, past the, the solar disk, so we could discover the entrance and the the exit of the planet on the solar disk. And that was one of the first actually huge uh, uh, international collaborations because we uh, astronomers need, needed um, calculations or, or observations from many parts of the world from where they could find out the distances of the planets, uh, planets in our solar system. But there were two two uh, two phenomena uh, during the the uh, entrance and the exit of, of Venus on the solar disk that that uh, uh, was uh, particularly um, intriguing for 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 many uh, astronomers. Uh, they, they found the, f the phenomena of a bright ring around the, the planet, and also a black drop. Uh, that you might see on, on these pictures. So, and, and these phenomena were 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 thought that they could be caused by an atmosphere of Venus. So maybe the, the, the Venus has an atmosphere in the same, uh, similar to our Earth. And uh, the Russian uh, astronomer and uh, scientist uh, Lomonosov, he he he. he uh, he argued that, that based on these observations, I conclude that the planet Venus is surrounded by a distinguished air atmosphere similar or even possibly larger than that is poured over our Earth. So uh, Venus became actually in the end of 18th century uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 a possible uh, habitable world. Johann Hieronymus Schröter, he, he, he said that uh, he, he that he had discovered enlightened mountains are on on Venus. William Herschel, uh, he believed that it, it could be an atmosphere on, on Venus, but he couldn't see these mountains on, on the surface of Venus. Uh, but, but the question here is that the, it's the same way of analogical uh, thinking that, that you find earlier and that you also find today uh, sometimes in astrobiology. If you could find a list of similarities between Earth and another planet, uh, we could conclude that also the other planet would have life. So for example, here in Venus, they thought that Venus is a the same size of Earth, and and it, it seemed to have a planet. Some people think, and they had also it has a, an atmosphere and mountains, uh, and it was uh, orbiting around the sun. Uh, so, if we could find a number of similarities between Earth and Venus, we conclude that that uh, Venus must have life, also. Schröter, he said, I cannot think that providence would bless the inhabitants of Venus incomparably less than with the happiness of seeing the works of almighty power and of discovering, like a Herschel, still more and more distant regions of the universe. We must adhere to the analogy till indisputable experiments convince us the contrary. Uh, and uh, 
in, in the in the beginning of the nineteenth century, people, uh, some, some astronomers also thought about the way of communicating with other planets. Uh, Carl Gauss, he, he said that we could could uh, make uh, Pythagorean rectangular uh, rectangular <laughs> triangles in, in the in the plains of of Siberia, and if we, if the lunarians could see these triangles, they they could find out that we know the Pythagorean theorem and that we are intelligent. Uh, Litro he he said that we could. Uh, uh, make construct gigantic uh, channels um, uh, w with concentric rings and uh, fill it with water and top with kerosene and and uh, and make it to fire uh, and then these circles could be seen from from the moon and of course one one uh, perhaps the most famous uh, Example from from the nineteenth century is uh, Schiaparelli and uh, and Percival Lowell's idea uh, that that there could be channels on on Mars, uh, and that says something about how difficult it is to to make the right conclusions from what you see. Uh, your observations when, when we are looking in the uh, telescopes or when we are using as uh, our observation they are theory loaded you don't really see the world objectively everything you see and all the information you gather you need to process and make meaning of and if if you believe in in life out there in space, you probably s look for it, for it and see it, even though the, it doesn't exist. Like Schiaparelli and Percival, they saw lines on the surface of the moon, and they believed that it could be life on the Mars, and uh, and thought that these lines might be channels where where the lunarians uh, use it for for water supply. Uh, for for their fields, uh, and a microscope is also uh, an uh, important uh, in invention uh, th that changed the way of, of seeing the world. That even a small drop of water consists of life. So life could exist in in the small scale. So uh, what is life? That that's a huge question. So I I I think I I I leave that question for for discussion later on. But that's also an important part of this story. What what is life? And different explanations of what life is. Vitalism was one way of understanding life, that there's a li principle of life that exists in, in matter. But life could also be explained as motion or even electricity. That's the example with Galvani, who, who made the experiment with, with a frog and found that if we uh, 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 put uh, uh, use el electricity on this frog, it w the, their legs will, will start moving. And maybe electricity is something that is important for life. And that's what Marichelle's novel uh, is about, how, how we could spark the life with, with the electricity from, from, a, from the thunder. Um, yeah, uh, so I could go on with, with the important um, discoveries in, in the in 20th century, uh, in 19th, 20th century, the spectroscopy, uh, genetics, and I would say also the space pr program in the 20th century is, is very uh, important way, important uh, step towards uh, our modern astrobiology. But I, I would say there is two uh, 
observations in astrobiology that I think made astrobiology as a scientific discipline in, in a in modern view. The first is the the, the discovery or, or the, of extra, extremophiles, that life could exist in very remote and very extreme environments. And so life could actually survive and thrive on on environments that we know exist elsewhere in the universe, even in, within our uh, solar system. So life, the, the, the life has a much broader uh, variety and flexibility than we know, that we didn't know before we, we, we started studying the extremophiles. The other important discovery, I think, for astrobiology is the, 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 um, the first definite <coughs> detection of an exoplanet, that the planets, uh, there are actually planets in other solar, uh, around other stars. And that discovery was made in 1995 by uh, Mayor and Kelo. So before that, we didn't know actually that there are planets around other, other stars. So now we know uh, thousands of other planets around uh, in outer space. So we nowadays, astrobiology really has something to, do, to, 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 to study. There is not, not just a not, not just uh, imagine, uh, imaginary uh, thinking, there is something that we could study. So uh, to, to summarize, I, I think that uh, astrobiology, even though we will never find any life out there in, in the universe, I think astrobiology is very important and, and interesting uh, topic because it say, uh, something about ourselves. Uh, it says something, uh, it, it could answer questions about how, how life started here on Earth, what, what life needs to, to, to exist, and, but also how we, about our, our own conceptions of, of the universe. So astrobiology is a result of endeavors, ideas, and collaborations of thousands of people and generations of scientists and thinkers. So astrobiology is uh, not, not only uh, some few uh, intelligent people in the history. Uh, actually, why we are sitting here today depends on thousands of other people's thoughts in history uh, that made it possible for us to sit here and discuss these questions. That, I think, is one one thing you could learn from, from the history of astrobiology. And also that uh, astrobiology uh, biology challenge our limits of knowledge. How could we know uh, what, what is possible to know and what, what is not possible to know and what would we never know? Uh, and that's what I think is very interesting with astrobiology. So uh, you could say that uh, astrobiology is the last frontier of imagination uh, because we don't really know what is possible out there in space. Uh, we, so there's still something uh, you can imagine. For example, as a historian, uh, I, I can't uh, Imagine that that there are bicycles in in, uh, in 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 the Roman antiquity, for example, that, or there were computers in in uh, the antiquity. Uh, uh, so there are limits for what 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 is possible. Think about Roman history, for example. But in astrobiology, the limits are, of imagine is uh, is <coughs> less certain. <coughs> Uh, so astrobiology is about us. Uh, 
And if we will find something out there in space, I, I think that will change our way of, of thinking about ourselves and it will change uh, what we think about life uh, and our human existence. And I'm sure that we will be astonished and surprised. It will go beyond our, our beliefs, go, on, go far beyond our ordinary thinking. So I am there. Thank you.